Good afternoon, teens. How are we doing today? Welcome to San Antonio, and a special thanks to Dave Pachta and Phil Arsenal and many others who've worked so hard to make this conference awesome. Amen? And also, let's give up a round of applause for all those who've been singing and sharing their hearts and praying for us. Awesome. Come to the mountain of the Lord. Amen? That's what we're going to talk about right now. So if you have your Bibles, turn them on. Turn them on or open them. You know, if you got a text, not right now because you're not looking at your cell phones, amen? But if you got a text that said, meet me on the mountain, signed God. Meet me in the lobby of the Marriott, signed God. Jesus. That'd be a little freaky. That'd be a little scary to get a text like that. But there was a man in the Old Testament who got a text kind of like that. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19. Verse 11. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. Now I've seen wind knock down trees. I haven't seen wind knock down a mountain. This wind knocked down mountains, shattered mountains. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. Anyone ever been in an earthquake? Some people, okay. And you're still here, amen? But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. You know, I think God was kind of testing him and said, you know, if I said I was coming to see you, if God says I'm coming to see you, you have this idea, what is it going to be like? And first, there's this incredible wind that's blowing and knocking everything over. And Elijah's like, whoa, okay, it's not in the wind. What's going to happen now? Earthquake and everything's shattering and shaking. Very scary. But he's not in the earthquake. And you think, okay, what could possibly come now? And then this fire comes down from the heavens. But God's not in the fire. And now he's bracing himself. What could possibly come even more powerful than wind, earthquake, fire? What's next? gentle whisper. And I think he freaked out more about that than all the other options. Let's try it out loud, as loud as you can. God loves you. As loud as you can. One, two, three. God loves you. That's inspiring. That's powerful. Now I want you to lean over and whisper in the ear next to you, God loves you. Go ahead and do it. See, when you this is what I'm seeing right now. It's like this. When I saw God loves you the first time, it was like. And then when I saw it the second time, it was like. <laughs> God is so close to you. God is big. It's true. God is powerful. It's true. God can move mountains. That's true. But what he really is, is he wants to be close to you. He wants to be so close to you that he can't even speak in a normal tone. He can only whisper. Because he's so close to you. To you. Amen? You know, first time I heard God's whisper, I was at a tennis tournament. I was playing tennis, and, and a coach of another player came up to me and said, Sean, do you believe in God? And I said, and I was an atheist actually at the time, and I said, you know, God is for losers. God's for wimps, for people who have nothing better to do with their life. And he said, Sean, what do you believe in? I said, well, I'm an electrical engineer. I'm really smart. I'm I figured out the world and the universe, and I'm just so smart, and I don't need God. And then he said, well, you know, Sean, there's a story in the Bible where the sun stopped for 24 hours. And I said, yeah, I don't really believe that either. And he said, but take a look at this journal. And he opened up a, sci a, a Scientific American journal, and there was an article in there that said that there's 24 hours missing in time. That there's 24 hours that they can't find. And this 24 hours kind of dated back to the time when Joshua prayed for the sun to stop for 24 hours. Wow. 
And I went home that night and I thought, maybe there is a God. And if there's a God, then there's a heaven and there's a hell. And if there's heaven and hell, I need to be a lot more sure of myself than I just think I'm really smart. There's way too much at risk if there is a God, so I better figure this out. So I came back to him the next day and I said, look, I think I believe in God. What do I need to do? And he said, pray with me and tell God you love him and you'll be saved. I thought, really? He said, yeah, just say, God, you love him and and all your sins will be forgiven. And I said, well, last night I was at a bar. I had way too much to drink and I think I told 20 people in the bar I love them. (laughs) But I don't remember any of their names. Are you telling me that God would stop the sun, but all I need to do today is say I love you and I'm saved? And I said, you know, thank you so much for helping me believe in God, but I don't think you have it figured out. So I went home and I bought a Bible and I decided I'm going to study the Bible and I'm going to figure this out. So I bought the Bible, opened up to Matthew, and I read that first chapter where it says someone's the father, someone the father, someone the father, someone the father, someone. I read all that and I thought, you know what, this is going to be a lot harder than I thought. I have no idea what to do. But when I went to bed, I prayed. I said, God, if you're out there, help me find you. That was Sunday night. Tuesday, on the way from one engineering building to another engineering building, someone stopped me on campus. It was like minus 10 degrees outside. Stopped me. I had on my Walkman. I was listening to music. And and he asked me to take it off. I take it off. And he said, I want to invite you to a Bible talk. I was like, wow, you know, I never knew people stopped people and invited them to Bible talks. And I thought, maybe this is the answer to my prayer two days ago. I said, well, so what's going to be there? And he said, well, it's a Bible study. We talk about the Bible. And, and I thought, well, you know, what else will be there? And he said, there will be food. I said, okay, I'm coming. <laughs> I was a campus student. We're always hungry, amen? I came to Bible talks, studied the Bible, and two months later, I became a Christian. Amen, church? Remember the first time you heard him whisper to you. But Jesus knew people would have a hard time changing their picture of God from this earthquake, mind-shattering, life-powerful, cosmic person to this personal person. He knew he would struggle with that. So when he taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, what did he start with? Our Father. He started with Father because he wanted us to change our picture of God. And if I have any prayer for the teens this weekend, that you change your picture of God. That it will get bigger and wider and you'll better understand who God really is. We're actually going to look at a video here in a second. Uh, Let's look at another slide here. There's another slide. That's my father. And then now I'm a father for Andrew and Deanna. All of us have a father. You couldn't get into this hall, you can't get to the planet Earth without having a father. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now, some of us had great dads. Some of us had dads that tried. Some of us may not even know who our dad is. But no matter what kind of dad you had, or how awesome he was, God is even more awesome. Even your dad's greatest day at being a dad, your dad's best day at being a dad, doesn't even come close to the kind of dad God is. God is the most amazing dad. And we're going to watch a video here in one second that shows, you know, us dads, we try. It doesn't always work out, and we try. And the name of this video is Mom Went to Go Get Ice Cream and Left Dad in the Park with Two Kids. Let's see what happens. We'll need a little volume.
Okay. Great video, yeah? That's one of my home videos, amen? Dads try, but no one can be a dad like God. No one is the same father like God is. And you know, in the Bible, Jesus uses the word father 200 times in the New Testament. And the word father that they use is actually Abba. And what Abba means, it, it means something very close. It's like something you would even say at home. It's not even a word you might even use in public to say to your dad, because it's like da it's daddy, it's very intimate. And when Jesus taught all of us to pray, when he taught the apostles to pray, he said, the word you use is father. God wants to be our father. Amen, church? Now, how do we become God's children? Let's check out. We can maybe fly through a couple slides here. I'm not sure what's... But it's through adoption. God wants to adopt you. You know, when, when people get... Not people get pregnant, because I can't get pregnant. When women get pregnant, you know, they... they uh, sometimes it's a bit of a surprise. And, you know, maybe the husband comes home at night and says... And the wife says, honey, I got a surprise. Yeah, what's up? I'm pregnant. <laughs> awesome. I think, awesome, yes, awesome, yes, awesome. You know, it's very exciting. But adoption is never a surprise. It's not like I come home and my wife says, honey, I got a surprise. What's up? I adopted today. That's not how adoption works. Adoption takes planning. It takes resources. You even know the kid ahead of time before you adopt them. It's a very different process. God adopted you. God wants to adopt you. It's not an accident. You're not here because of your parents. You're here because God chose you. And he wants to be with you. He wants to adopt you. Amen? Now, let's go to the first one. God has a vision. Romans 8, 15. And his vision is to adopt you. His dream is to adopt you. Romans 8, 15. You guys find it? Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Amen? We're not slaves. We don't have to be afraid. We get to be a part of God's family. Look at this next slide. If we can look at um, the tall guys slide. Maybe. Ooh, okay. Okay. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, hold on. This is a Christian conference, amen? The mission of these guys is to win. Their mission is to score baskets. Their mission, they get up, they think about it, they train, they do everything to win, win, win. They want to win games, they want to score more points than, than the opponent's. Their mission is to win. Next slide. His mission, when he was still alive, was to make the greatest technology possible. The most amazing technology. That was his mission. He ate, drank, slept. New technology. That was his mission. Next one. Okay. What's his mission? His mission was to come up with these crazy ideas of how to heal people with these incredibly wild diseases that no one else can heal. Next slide. <laughs> Jesus' mission is to adopt you. His number one dream is to adopt you. His desire more than anything is for you to understand how much he loves you. And he'll do anything to get you into his family. You know, I remember the first time I met my, my now wife, but falling in love with Linda. You know when you fall in love, sometimes your tongue doesn't really work so good and you don't work so good and you don't know what to say and you're like repeating yourself and you're like, what do I say? You know, it doesn't really work. 
And I remember the first time I called her on the phone, I, I wrote down like seven things to talk about because I figured I'd freak out when I started talking to her. And then we went on our first date. And I remember our first date, and I was waiting by the metro station in Moscow, and I thought, I should buy her flowers so that she'll know how much I really like her, and she'll know how much I like her. And, you know, just in case I say something stupid, she'll know how much I like her. So I go and I buy a flower. And I'm standing there, and she still hadn't shown up, and she's about to get there, and I'm thinking, the flower's too much. She's going to think I'm in love with her, and she's going to freak out and not want to talk to me. I should throw it away. So I threw it away. And then I'm standing there, I thought, Sean, you're so prideful. If you like her, just show her you like her. And then I went back to the trash and got the flower out. <laughs> a year later, she agreed to be my wife when we were married. Amen? But God has that same dream to be in a relationship with you. He remembers the first time you prayed. He remembers the first time you sang a song. He remembers the first time you read the Bible. He remembers that. Because he loves us and wants us to be in his family. Amen? Next, God's motivation. Okay, we know God loves us, but what's his motivation? Why does, why does he want to adopt you? What makes us so special that he would actually want to adopt us? We're going to look at a couple slides. What is it about kids that makes us love them so much? Now, here's a young boy about to get on a skateboard that goes straight down to the pier. Maybe God loves us because we're just so naturally courageous, amen? <laughs> Next slide. Maybe it's because we're so helpful around the house and we take care of the pets. That's why. No, I don't think so. Next one. Maybe it's your artistic abilities and how awesome you are to draw. Or another one. Maybe you're just a great painter and you need to just... Okay, last slide here. Why do parents love their kids? Why do maybe one day you dream of having kids? It's because you want that special relationship. God's motivation. Why does he love us so much? Why does he want to adopt us? It's because he loves us. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 4 through 5. Go eat popcorn. It's the... Ephesians, right after Galatians. Okay, verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, there's the motivation. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. God knew you. Slide. There's a slide of the earth. And maybe there's not. There it is. Before God created that, he knew you. That's what this verse says. Next. Before he created that, he knew your name. God's motivation is love. It's in love. That's why he wants to be with you. You know, there's 7 billion people living on the planet today. If you took a penny, if you took pennies and wrote the names of every single living person on the planet, that's about 7 billion pennies. Now, what kind of space does 7 billion pennies take up? It takes up an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Imagine filling an Olympic-sized swimming pool with 7 billion pennies. And out of those 7 billion pennies, one of them has your name. One out of seven billion. And let's say, let's dive into the swimming pool and let's pull out 100,000 people that are saved today. What are the odds? What are the odds that someone's going to dive into a pool of seven billion pennies and find the one with your name on it? What are the chances that you'd even get to sit in this room? Do you have any idea how amazing it is that you're sitting in this room? God chose you because he loves you. You know, I always kind of feel bad when Christians think that the reason they're Christians is to do something. You know, me and Lena, we're very grateful we have two children, but let me tell you why we decided to have children. In our apartment, it was hard to keep it clean. So I thought, you know, we should have a kid that'll help us clean it. 
So he said, let's have kids. So we had a kid, and God bless us with an amazing boy, Andrew, and, and he was awesome. And, and we taught him from a young age how to clean. Because the reason we have kids is to do things, right? And then we thought, you know, the apartment got a little bit bigger, and it's more messy. He needs some help. So we decided to have another kid, and God gave us Deanna. And now she helps keep everything clean, too. That's not why we had kids. But some people think, well, the reason I'm in the kingdom, the reason I'm in the church is to do things. God brought me here to do this and do that, and we have to get that done, and we have to get this out, and we got to get that, and we got to do this, and I should do this, and I should do that, and I'm here to do things. That's why I'm in the kingdom. You're not here to do things. You're here because God adopted you. You're here because God loves you. Now, my children, praise God, help us do things at home. But it's because they love us and we're a family. But that's not the reason they're there. They're there because we are a family. God adopted us into his family. Amen, church? You know, God does crazy things to adopt people. I remember there was a Bible talk in Kharkov, Ukraine. And they were a little bit discouraged because they hadn't been helping anyone become a Christian. And they decided to walk out into the park at like 6 in the morning and sing and pray to God and get their boldness back to help other people become Christians. So they go out into the park at 6.30 and they kind of huddle up the four brothers there and they start singing and praying and singing and praying and singing and praying. And after about 20 minutes, a guy comes down from a tree next to him. <laughs> with a rope in his hand. And he said, can a man commit suicide in peace? He came there that morning to kill himself. But after hearing 20 minutes of songs about grace and love and prayers... He came down out of the tree. And the brother's like, whoa, whoa, why would you want to kill yourself? Life can't be that bad. You should change. God changed our lives. You can change. And he, they started to share. They started studying the Bible. And two weeks later, he was baptized into Christ. Amen? God will do crazy things to adopt us into his family. He'll even send a Bible talk underneath your tree. If that's what it takes. Amen? The third thing. So God wants to adopt us. He does it because he loves us. But how does he actually do it? How do you actually adopt? It's through redemption. Look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. You guys doing okay? Do you need a hug? You do. Can you give a quick hug to the person next to you? I don't got time to get to all of you. Quick hug and be flipping over to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. Did you find it? Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you're a son, God has also made you into an heir. You know, if you've adopted, if, if your family's adopted someone, or if you know families that have adopted someone, adoption's very, very expensive. Some countries, if you adopt from some countries, it can cost up to $50,000 to adopt a child. That's expensive. Do you have any idea how much it costed to adopt you? What did God have to pay to bring you into his family? His son. And you know, we as people don't like to pay more for something than what it costs. I'm not going to pay a billion dollars for an eye, whatever iPhone, iPod, iPad, I whatever you want to say. You don't pay a billion dollars for that. It doesn't cost that. God paid exactly what you costed to him. He paid with the life of his son. Slides. We're going to have to hit a couple slides here. Here's a slide of Tarzan. Okay. Tarzan. Now, you guys know the story about Tarzan, right? He was a boy whose parents unfortunately died and he was kind of adopted by some, some gorillas. And he lives and grows up with the gorillas, and he learns gorilla language, and he can fly like gorillas, and he's almost like a gorilla. 
I'm not sure that would actually work. We won't try it, but I'm, I'm not sure, maybe. But if you were adopted into a gorilla family, you would have to live with the gorillas. Now, next slide. Let's say you were adopted into this family. Now, if you're going to be adopted into this family, something radical is going to have to change with you. You're going to have to start growing hair everywhere, or you're going to freeze. You couldn't just plop into that family and they take care of you and you'd be okay. Something radical within would have to change for you to survive. Next slide. Nemo. Okay, let's say you were adopted into Marlon's family and you were going to be Nemo's brother or cousin or whatever. Something really radical would have to change with you. Because if we dropped you in the water to live with that family, you'd probably drown. You'd have to get some gills going on real quick to be able to survive in that. Next slide. Oh, go back a slide. We'll stay on Nemo for a second. How can you, someone who's imperfect and impure, live with a God? God can have nothing to do with sin. God cannot be in fellowship with sin. God cannot be connected to sin. You cannot enter into God's family unless you're like a God. You can't live with Nemo unless you're like a fish. And you can't live with that polar bear family unless you've got a lot of fur. And you cannot live with God unless you are like God. You would have to be perfect like God to live with God. To be one of his kids, you'd have to be flawless. You'd have to have absolutely no sin on you to enter into his family. Look at Acts chapter 2. How does that happen? Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, to enter into God's family... To be able to have God live with you, you have to be absolutely perfect. You have to be flawless. You have to have no sin. Well, Sean, how in the world can we do that? Well, Jesus died so that you could be absolutely perfect. You're able to live and function and survive in a family of God's because he died for your sins. And you're so perfect that God can actually live in you. Can I get an amen from the church? Amen. That's what Jesus has done for us. That's what happens. Amen? Now I've come to this question, who's your daddy? <laughs> who's your daddy? This is the question I need all of us to focus in just for a little bit because we've got to answer this one. God is an amazing God. He's an amazing father. But God lets it be your choice. Who's going to be your father? God lets you choose which kind of dad you want. And the dad you choose, you'll spend your time on earth with, and you will spend eternity with the dad you choose. Let's look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Verse 42 through 44. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. Jesus said to them, all the teens in this hall, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and now I'm here. I've not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. All of us have a choice who our father is going to be. It's God or the devil. Everyone sitting in this hall right now has one of two fathers. 
It's either God or it's the devil. Before I got baptized, the devil was my father. After I got baptized, God was my father. Now, before I got baptized, I didn't think the devil was my father. I was a good guy. I was an atheist, but I still thought I was going to heaven. Why not? I believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> Cut me some slack. I'm not as bad as that guy. But you know what? I lived in this world of lies. And I kept telling myself lies. You're not that bad. Oh, I'm better than most. God's a good guy. Everything will be okay. And then the lies just keep going. D don't tell your parents about this. D don't tell your friends and, and, and the pornography and, and I won't tell that and I won't say this and maybe I stole some here, but that's okay. Nobody needs to know. And I just live in this world of lies. And I'm listening to the wrong father. And then praise God, someone opened up the scriptures with me and helped me see that there's a choice. That that father who I thought was, uh, was good and okay and I'm comfortable with actually turned out to be Satan. We have to choose who's going to be our father. You have to choose who you want to spend eternity with. Imagine this. Imagine you're sitting in a room and someone explains to you that the person in the room with you that's saying is your father is actually Satan. And at that moment, you get really nervous and really scared. And maybe some of us here sitting here who thought everything was okay and, you know, it's no big deal. Actually, maybe you're even a little shocked that, that if God's not your father, if you haven't been baptized, that actually Satan's your father at this moment. That may scare you a little bit. But then at that very moment, when you understood that, God walks in the door. He walks in the door and he said, I've come to take my son or daughter home. Satan's outraged. You can't take him home. He owes me. He sinned. He deserves this. God says, I will pay the price. I'll pay the price of my son, but I'm going to take him home. He's going to be my son. And my daughter. And Satan's enraged, but he can't say anything because God is speaking truth and God is righteous. But then Satan says to God, he says, yeah, but he still has to choose. And then Satan and God both turn and look. Looks you right in the eye. And God says, do you want to come home with me? Do you want me to be your father? It's not about joining the church. It's not about just getting baptized. Whose family do you want to be in? Who do you want to spend life on earth with? The dad who's trying to destroy you every chance he gets? Or do you want to walk on this planet with the father who actually knit you together? The father who controls the sun and the universe. The one that can bless you beyond your imagination. Which father do you want to spend one more day with. And then for eternity, for billions and billions of years, do you want to be with God in heaven or Satan in hell? This is the choice that's before you right now. I don't know about you, but I think there's really only one good choice. And at this point, after that moment, it's very hard to even come up with another reason to wait any longer. God's offering to adopt me. It's costing him everything he's got. That's how much he loves us. Amen, church? Amen. You know, I remember the adoption of, of a brother. His name's Sergei Kononenka. He's a Russian wrestler guy. Really big guy. Weighs about 330 pounds. Looks a lot like a refrigerator with legs and arms. Amen? <laughs> and Sergei, he was the number two Greco-Roman wrestler in Russia. And he's actually at this conference, if you see him, if you see a walking refrigerator, go up and hug him and say hi. He'd love it. But Sergey was at a wrestling match, like the European Championships. And we had another brother in the church named Oleg, who was a, a lightweight wrestler. Uh, but Oleg was trying to share his faith with Sergey. And Sergey hated our church. He hated anyone from our church. 
And then uh, during a break, Oleg said to Sergey, hey, come meet Andy Fleming, who leads our church in Moscow. And Sergey says, yeah, show me this leader of Moscow church. I'll talk to him. Sergey walks up and says, and they're, they're kind of exchanging a few words. And said, he said, your church is a joke. God isn't with your church. And Andy said, yes, he is. And he said, prove it to me. And Andy said, how? And he said, okay, this next match has the former European wrestling champion going up against a guy who's barely qualified. If God is with you, pray that the champion loses to this new guy. And if he loses, I'll study the Bible. And he said, okay. And he grabs the Christians, go off to the corner, and they start praying. God, help this champion guy lose to this new guy. So that Sergei will, will study the Bible. They come back, and the match is about to start. This, this returning European champion gets in front of this guy. This is the first time at the championships. And this guy, first time at the championships, grabs the champion, flips him over, and pins him in 20 seconds. And Andy goes up to Sergey and punches him on the chest. I'll see you tomorrow night for Bible study. <laughs> Sergey studied the Bible, became a Christian, and now he's an evangelist in the Moscow Church of Christ. Amen. You know, in conclusion, Luke 15, 7, God loves to throw adoption parties. Luke 15, 7, who likes parties? Parties rock. God likes parties. He's a party animal, amen? Luke 15, 7, he loves to throw parties, but his favorite party to throw is adoption parties. For many of us, he's already thrown an adoption party. Let's never forget it, amen? For many of us, he was getting ready to throw an adoption party. He's blowing up the balloons. He just needs you to choose who you want your father to be. Luke 15, 7, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. God wants to throw a party. God wants to be with you for eternity. There's nothing better than being with God. Life doesn't always get easier. Sometimes it gets harder, but you get to be with God. And you get to be with God for eternity. You know, the day's going to come when you're walking down campus or walking out of your school or you're driving home with your parents, and all of a sudden you're going to hear this noise. And it's going to get louder and louder, and it's like these trumpets or something. It's some kind of trumpet noise or something, and you're thinking, and it gets louder and louder, and you're thinking, wow, our stereo isn't that good. Where's all this noise coming from? And then your, your mom or dad pulls over, or you pull over if you're driving, amen, drive carefully. You pull over, and, and, and you get out of the car, and you realize that the streets become like a parking lot. And everyone's looking up at the sky. And you're staring, and the noise is getting louder and louder, these trumpets. Then all of a sudden, the sky rips open like curtains. And this incredible light pours through. And then you start to see this rainbow of colors come through, Millions of colors, colors you've never even seen before. And at this moment, angels start to fly through the opening. Thousands upon thousands and thousands and thousands, and angels are flying in, and all their wings are moving in unison. And they're chanting, holy, 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 holy. Million upon million and million, and everyone's just staring up. The entire world is staring up at the heavens. And when the last angel takes its place, the chanting stops. You could hear a pin drop. And you're standing up at the opening, and then all of a sudden, a man riding on the horse with the silhouette of a king comes through the opening. And he announces, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the first, and the last. And at this, all the angels fall on their knees. Everyone on earth falls on their knees. You fall on your knees. And you're crouched down thinking, okay, what happens next in Revelation? I forgot. What, what's the thing? Okay. This is awesome. It doesn't matter I didn't study for my exam tomorrow. It doesn't matter I don't have a job. It doesn't matter I don't have any money. It doesn't matter that my team lost the basketball game. At that moment, nothing matters. And as you're crouched down, kind of stressing out a little bit, all of a sudden you start to float up. And you get about two feet off the ground and you're thinking... Wow, this is awesome. I've always wanted to fly. This is so cool. And as you get about two or three 
10, 10, 12 feet off the ground, you look down and you see the people who are not going up. Imagine the look in their face of fear, question, well, what's going to happen to me? And there's a sadness in our heart, but, but we look at these people, these people are either people that, that knew and didn't want to, or they gave up. Or maybe we just didn't reach out to them. And there's kind of a bitterness in our heart, but then we get above the trees. And you're floating up above the trees, and you start to see the brothers and sisters over the trees. Bro, check me out! <laughs> Sister, I guess we won't have a date tonight, but that's no big deal, amen? <laughs> and everyone's starting to fellowship, and everyone's talking and giving high fives and flipping around, and, and we're all going up. And you, San Antonio Church starts to see the Houston and the Dallas Church. And you get up higher and you see all the states, the Phoenix Church and the Florida Church and the Chicago Church. You're going up higher and you see the European churches and the Chinese churches. And you go higher and you see the African churches and you go higher. And the Kiev Church, pray for us, amen. We want to be there too. <laughs> the worldwide fellowship will be called up fellowshipping with each other, and you're so fired up about the crowds, you think, okay, okay, where are we going? And you look up and you see them. For the first time in your life, you've pictured Jesus a million different ways, but you never knew what he looked like. And you can't take your eyes off of him. Now you don't even see the crowds. All you see is Jesus. And he pulls you in until you're standing right in front of him. And Jesus is going to look you in the eye. And he's going to say, I'm so proud of you. That's my three-minute warning. I'm so proud of you. And he's going to hug you, and it's going to feel like a hundred arms wrapped around you. He's going to separate you out and say, welcome home. Amen, church? God wants to adopt you. It's because he loves you. His motivation is love, and he's paid the price to bring you home. Church, who's your daddy? You're supposed to answer that question. Thank you. Let's try that again. Church, who's your daddy? Church, who's your daddy? God. If, God, Dad's been, if, if God's been your daddy for a few years or a few months, let's recommit at this conference. God's going to be my daddy. If you're studying the Bible or you're thinking about it or you're wondering what kind of, you know, should I do it or not do it or what's that like, who's your daddy? Satan's not an option. The devil's not an option. You are too precious. You're too wonderful to spend eternity away from God. Church, who's your daddy? Stand up with me here. Church. Church of Christ. Who's your daddy? God. Who's your daddy? God. Amen. Let's bring him glory. Thank you. <laughs>